All right, everyone. Um, this is going to be a gRPC crash course, and uh, we have a lot to get through, so let's get going. Uh, like Cassandra said, my name is Alan Shreve. Um, I'm in Contrievable on the internets. Um, follow me on Twitter. So I wanted to get started by talking about how microservices talk to each other. And uh, I think we all know how they do, and it is soap. No, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. Uh, it's not actually soap. Um, we've, we've kind of all agreed that it's, it's HTTP JSON um, or, or REST um, if we're like developing public APIs, right? Um, and, and I have something to tell you. Like, I will die a happy man if I never have to write another REST client library in my life. They are just the most boring things to write because it's, it's the same, like, JSON parsing over and over again, the same, like, issues with HTTP timeouts and everyone, you just keep doing these things over and over again. And there are a lot of other, like, things that I, I kind of don't like about the, the REST and HTTP JSON model. Um, streaming is difficult. Um, you can't even do bidirectional streaming. It's not as efficient it, as it could be. Um, there's no formal API contract. There's no machine-readable contract, which is why we have to get humans to write client libraries for them. And uh, humans are expensive, and they don't like writing client libraries. Um, it's, I don't know. It's just like a machine should do it or something like that. So that kind of brings us to, like, well, what could we do differently? Like, what could we do better? And that brings us to gRPC. gRPC is a high-performance, open-source, universal RPC framework. Um, rather than continue to tell you more about it, I thought we should actually build a service together in it. And we're going to start with like a really small tutorial service and then continually make it more complicated uh, as we add more production requirements. So I thought we should build a caching service. Uh, it's a really simple service, just kind of like a key value. You put in a key with a value, and then you have another operation to pull it out. And what's interesting about this kind of service that you may not be used to is that when you define it, you don't actually define it in code first. You actually define it in an IDL, in an interface definition language. So this uh, particular language is the protobuf uh, language. And basically what you're doing is you're defining this service in this language. Um, and then you'll use that to actually get code out via code generation. So I'll just walk you through really quickly like what this looks like. This is our caching service. So you see we define a, a cache service. It has two calls, store and get. I don't know why I didn't call it put. That would have made more sense. Um, and looking closer at like the store request, basically every single gRPC function, every uh, function takes a single parameter as an input and a single parameter as output. Um, the way that you pass multiple values in and out is you add those as, um, as fields on the messages, uh, the input message or the output message. So here's the store request and the store response, and the store request has the key and value that you want to put into the cache, and the get method has the key in the get request, and the response has the value that it will return out. It seems pretty straightforward. And here's the crazy part. Now you have client libraries in nine different languages just from that file. You download the proto C compiler, whatever, and you basically run it against that particular file, and it will spit out all of those different definitions. Uh, you do have to download uh, plugins if you want to generate Go and Java code, but it's pretty straightforward. Uh, and beyond that, you also have server stubs generated for that API in seven different languages. Um, so that's really You didn't have to do any work. It just happened. This is also generated by the same compiler. So let's take a look at using that code. We're not going to look at the generated code itself. Um, I'm going to show you how to use that code to actually build uh, a service. So let's take a look at server.go, where we're going to build this. And so we'll start off with just like a simple like server main function. All it's going to do is call run server and check for an error. Um, the first thing that we're going to do is create a server object. And then we're going to use this RPC package. And that RPC package is the thing that was generated by the Proto C compiler from our IDL. And so it generates a bunch of methods for us. And one of them that it generates is register cache service. And so basically, we're going to hand that our object that implements the cache service. And then we'll tell it to listen on a particular port for traffic. Uh, then we'll actually like implement that cache service object. Right now, we're not actually going to implement it. We'll just do the skeleton of it. So there's a get request. Um, 
which takes in a context and the git rec object that you remember we defined in our IDL, and it returns the git resp uh, object that we defined in our IDL as well, and possibly an error. And the same thing with the store function with store rec and store resp. Then let's look at how we call that service. So same thing, just got a little wrapper function um, around uh, the thing that's going to call it. And basically what we do is we're going to dial that service. Just like with net, gRPC has a similar thing that does the connection setup, which we'll call net under the hood since we're passing a TCP address. And we tell it where to connect. And then we wrap. Uh, we use the RPC package again to basically tell the there's a stub right that we use to call out to the service. And we wrap that around the connection. And from that point, we can use that cache object, that stub, uh, to actually make remote calls. So the first thing we'll do is we'll create is we'll do a store request um, where we pass in a store rec with the key gopher and the value con, and then we'll fetch it back out again with a get rec um, for the get method, and then print it out. Uh, notice that we didn't have to write any serialization code. We didn't have to write any network code. We didn't have to do any of that because gRPC takes care of all of it for you. Some of you may be looking at this and being like, oh no. Oh no, I've been here before. This is just WSDL all over again. And to some extent, like we are borrowing things from WSDL, right? We are basically using the same idea of a machine readable uh, format and generating libraries from it. Um, but we've also learned a lot of things from that. And um, that's kind of what makes gRPC special is that uh, there's you know, a huge amount of focus on not making the same mistakes that were made in those uh, like older generated RPC protocols. Um, things like compatibility were a huge issue in the design of this and making sure that you can change the APIs in backwards compatible ways, uh, in ways that previous RPC formats would not let you do, like SOAP and WSDL. OK, so let's go back to our code and actually like implement the methods. This should be pretty straightforward. Basically, we're just going to create a map. And then when we call, when we have the implementation of our get method, we're just going to look in that map and return a get resp with the value that we pulled out of the map. And the store request, straightforward. We're just going to take the key and value on the request object and put them into the map. Uh, you'll notice there's no locking. Just imagine it there. Because uh, these things will be con called, called concurrently, of course. But like, what happens if the key isn't in the map? Right? We needed to return an error. So gRPC has error handling, of course. And um, this is kind of what it looks like. Basically, there are a number of different error codes that are defined. Um, and you return an error code and a message, kind of like HTTP, right? Um, but no response body, uh, which is interesting. And we'll come back to that. Uh, there are a bunch of different error types. There are like 16 of them, uh, not found and deadline exceeded, invalid request, things like that. It's a weird number. It's like if there were 16, like there are probably more, right? Um, <laughs> so uh, it's kind of an interesting trade off between like categorizing those and user defined error codes, uh, which are not very well supported yet in the implementations. So uh, you have your little service. You're like, OK, it does all the things it needs to do. Um, I'm ready to like put it into production. And the SRTE team is like, no, you got to secure that thing. Um, the, the traffic to this has to be encrypted. So you go back, and you take a look at the gRPC docs, and you say, I think I can add encryption to it. Uh, you find a TLS key insert that are you know, lying around, and you stick them into a credential object. Um, and that gives you back an object that you can pass when you instantiate the server object. And basically, it just tells uh, the server to listen for TLS connections. And similarly, you do the same thing on the client. Uh, you create a same sort of um, TLS configuration, and you tell it, this is how I want you to create the TLS connection. Obviously, in prod, you're not using insecure skip verify. Um, you want to probably use your own root space and things like that. Uh, and then likewise, you pass that object, uh, that option that you get back into the dial function so that when it sets up the connection, um, it will do it with TLS. So at this point, you're kind of like, well, that's cool. And it all works. And I didn't really have to know a whole bunch about how it works under the hood, but I would like to because you always have leaky abstractions. So let's take a little bit um, of a look at what's going on. gRPC on the wire uses HTTP2. Um, 
basically what's going on is that there is a single or pool of long-lived TCP connections that are set up between a gRPC client and a gRPC server. And every single request and response, every transaction that you make over uh, um, gRPC is basically a new stream on one of those connections. And the actual input and output parameters are serialized protobuf um, in that call. That's pluggable, but protobuf is the only one that's implemented at this point. Um, since it's HTTP2, you also get client and server-side streaming, and hopefully we'll take a little bit of a look at that later. The implementations of gRPC, there are three at the moment. Um, C is the main one. It's the C core in uh, the terminology that they use. Um, basically, all of the languages except for Java and Go are just C bindings to this C core. Um, Java and Go both have native implementations. Uh, where did gRPC come from? It's a project out of Google. Basically, uh, Google has an internal RPC system called Stubby, and this is kind of the next iteration of it, um, developed in the open. Um, so it's uh, now an open source project um, with an open spec and contributors from many companies. Um, development still primarily done by Google devs, but get definitely getting contributors from, from more people. So you get a page, and you notice that your box is handling a lot of traffic. This, this little cache server suddenly has blown up, and it's all coming from one client. And you go to them, and you're like, what, what's going on? And they're like, man, I just wanted to cache everything. I just wanted to make it really fast. And you're like, well, that's not going to work. Um, how are we going to fix this? Well, we could add multi-tenancy. We could say like a particular user or an account can have so many keys devoted in the cache. So let's implement that. So we go back to our IDL, and we say, well, in our SOAR request, we want you to pass a token that identifies who you are, right? And we'll issue these tokens for you. And you put that token in there, and then we can identify you and know how many keys we're going to allow you to set. So similarly, then you have to have like another service that you consult to see how many keys that account is allowed to set. So you define a new service where you define a method get by token. Um, where you can pass in the token, and it'll return to you an account object, which tells, which has a property that says how many keys you're allowed to that account is allowed to set in the cache. Um, so when we actually go to implement that, um, we're not actually going to implement the account service. I mean, we've already implemented a simple request, request reply. You hand that off to someone else. But once you have the definition, the generated code, someone else can build the implementation, whatever language they want. And you go to your client code, and you add your account token that you got um, to your store request. And then in the server, the implementation becomes a little bit more complicated, but not too much. Basically, instead of just having a map of the things that we're storing, we also have another map that maps how many keys each account has already stored. And we also have, and this is the uh, interesting part, is we have a stub that lets us call out to the account service. So now our server is also a client of another server. So in our store functionality now, the first thing that we do when we get a new request is we actually call out to the account service and say, actually, we'd like the account object um, to check how many keys it's allowed to set. And then we'll check in our map. We'll say, how many keys has this person already set? And how many are they allowed to set? And if they're trying to set too many, we'll tell them, no, you're not allowed to do that. And at that point, um, we check whether that key is already in the map. If it isn't, we want to increment the number of keys that account has stored in the map. And then we can actually set the value and cache. So you do this, and you, you solve the multi-tenancy problem. That person can't set too many keys. Your server's back to being fine. But you get reports from other people that it's too slow. And you're like, man, I, don't, I have no idea why it's slow. And that's when you realize you have no observability. So you decide to rectify that. Um, so they tell you that they have an SLA, right? The client says, like, this service has an SLA, and it needs to respond within two seconds. You're like, well, I guess I'll add some logging and see what's going on. So you go back into your client code. And the first, and basically what you do is you find the calls where you're going to call get and, and store on the service, and you wrap them. You take the time beforehand and print it out afterwards. Really basic, but you just want to get started so you can start figuring out what's going on. You do the same thing in the server code around the account uh, call as well to get by token. And at that point, you're like, I wrote that three times. That's a lot of boilerplate. 
can I get rid of that? Can I reuse that code? You take a look at the gRPC docs and you find something called an interceptor. And an interceptor is kind of like middleware, but on the client side. Um, it's basically a piece of code where every time you're about to make a remote call, that code will get invoked, and you can use that code to wrap the call that's about to go out. So you create a new file called interceptor, and you look at the gRPC Go documentation, and it defines the API for the function that's uh, allowed to do intercepting. And it's a gigantic function, function signature that takes seven parameters. And you're like, wow, that's crazy. Um, but it's actually pretty straightforward to just pass through all of those parameters to the invoker, which will actually make the call to the remote service. And then you wrap that with getting the time and printing it out. And at that point, you're like, OK, I have an interceptor. Um, I wrap it up with a unary interceptor thing, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and at that point, you can install it. And so what you do is you go to your dial function, and you pass that as another option. So after your transport credentials, you pass another option that says, use this interceptor. And now all RPCs that are made over that connection use your interceptor and will print out those logs. Similarly, you do it in the server code, because your server code is also a client, right? And while you're looking around in the docs, you notice, like, oh, there's also this thing that's a server interceptor. And so it's basically the same thing, but it runs on the server side. So instead of having uh, an injection point when you're about to make a remote call, this is an injection point when a remote call has just come into a server, but before the server has actually serviced that request. So before it handed, hands off the code, or hands off the request to the code that we wrote earlier um, about what to do with git and store, it'll call this code. So you decided to write one of those, too, to measure the time on the server. That way you'll know how much time the server thinks, how much time the client thinks it's taking, and you can maybe suss out how much time is in the network. So same thing, there's a big function signature, um, but you know, it's pretty straightforward just to call the handler, which is the thing that actually invokes your, your client call, or sorry, that actually runs the business logic, and you pass it you know, the context and request. So you wrap that, you get the time, you print it out um, in a logging message. And similarly, you have to install it in the server. So when you create your server object, you pass another option into that um, to set that up. So you take a look at the logs, and you look at them, and you're like, wow, the account service, whoever wrote that did not do a very good job, because that is taking a really long time. So you're like, well, if I have to respond within two seconds, what I should do is I should add a timeout. So you go back into your server code, and you look at it, and you say, OK, well, that's pretty straightforward. I wrap the context with context with timeout. Um, pretty standard, right, from the standard library. Um, and then you pass that context into your call. So it'll only take two seconds. And they come back to you, and they're like, you're still failing the SLA. You're like, oh, that's right. Like, if, what if that call takes a full two seconds? Like, there's still time for my code to run. I'm still going to violate that SLA. And then another team comes up to you, and they're like, actually, we have a tighter SLA. We need one second response time from you. And you're like, actually, what I should do is I should just make that your problem. So you tell people to go into their clients, and they get to set their own timeout. So you say, like, in this client call, this one, the store request, I'll take up to a second. I need that to finish within a second, either success or failure. And uh, the git request, there's much tighter. You, much, you need to respond within 50 milliseconds. Um, but how does that interact with the timeout that you had set previously, the two-second timeout to the account service? So instead of that, it's the same sort of thing that we're used to doing with other things that handle context, which is that you propagate the context through. And so in that way, the deadline, the timeout for how long the entire operation takes from the original client call through all possible subservice calls, that kind of like branching tree of calls, uh, in our case, just this one, uh, gets propagated through. Um, and so they'll all basically deadline and finish at the same time. So you get a new requirement. Someone tells you, and I, I'll admit this is um, a little contrived, but I needed an example to show you uh, one of the pieces of functionality. But someone comes up to you and says, like, listen, uh, I want to be able to call your service with a dry run flag. I don't want it to actually execute that, but I want it to do everything except for make any side effects. And when you do it, I need it actually to work on every single mutable API in the entire platform. And you're like, wow, I have a whole one mutable operations in my entire platform. I have to do that in some reusable way. So you take a look at that, and you realize there's this uh, thing in gRPC called metadata, 
And basically, metadata is something that ends up on every um, RPC call, and it's kind of like headers, just a set of key value string pairs um, that are passed along with every RPC call. Uh, very much like HTTP headers, right? So you go into your server code, and you're like, well, I could use this. And the nice part about doing it this way, sorry, before we look at the code, is by using it in metadata with this sort of uh, string mapping of like setting a dry run header um, means that you could use it across all of your APIs without having to add a dry run flag, like a dry run parameter in every single request object in your IDL. And there's a trade-off. And the trade-off is that, well, in that case, you're not getting any type safety out of it, right? You don't get any of the guarantees of having generated code that will parse that stuff out for you. You're on the hook for doing that now. But it does give you that nice flexibility of making it essentially available anywhere that someone wants to implement it. So in your server code, instead of just actually storing stuff into the map, before you do that, you check to see whether it's a dry run. You write a new little function that pulls out the metadata from the context and checks the metadata for the dry run flag. Um, and if it's set to 1, you decide that that's a dry run. In the client code, the way that you tell the server that you want to do a dry run, same thing. It's just another context wrapper. Just like with timeout, instead, this is metadata new context. And you pass it the original context and then the pair of string key value that you want to send to the remote service. So you do that, and things are going well. And you start getting complaints that your service is, is still timing out. There's still problems. And you narrow it down to network problems. Someone is trying to call your service from another data center, right? Um, and it's going over the internet, and the internet has congestion problems. And you really can't fix the internet congestion problems, not a situation you're in at the moment. So what you can do is you can add retry logic. And before you go to every single call site and add retry logic, you say, hey, I wonder if I could do this in an interceptor. You come up with a crazy idea that what if you write the interceptor so that when you're about to make a call to a remote service, you wrap that in a for loop. And every time it returns an error, you just try again. Well, of course, you can't just try forever. Like When the timeout is finished, then you have to quit, right? because they passed in a timeout for how long it takes. So you need to check if the deadline is done before you uh, do the next retry attempt. So you put that out. You're like, yeah, this is pretty good. You try it out. It seems to work. And then you're in code review, and someone's like, hey, I don't think you want to retry every operation. That sounds like a bad idea. Like, there are definitely some operations that you probably can't take back. And you're like, hmm, that's probably a good idea. And even though our cache service does not have a FireZ missiles operation, um, there are certainly non identified operations that you imagine this being used for. So what you decide is you want a way for a caller to signal that an operation is not idempotent. So you decide, just like other people, just like um, the metadata thing that we looked at before and with timeout, we could also wrap the context to inject a value into the context that tells the interceptor, don't retry this operation. It's not idempotent. And so then you write the implementation for that. Uh, using context with value, which um, if you've used context before, just the straightforward way of adding a new value to your context, right? Um, so you settle on a key called idempotent, and you say, if it's not idempotent, we set that one to false. Um, and then we write a little function that will check a context to see if it has that flag. And then in your interceptor code, right before you're about to retry, you check, is this operation idempotent? And if it's not, then you're done. You don't retry it. So you deploy this, and um, you start noticing that all of your retry logic, um, with your retry logic, and you notice that something's not right. All of the operations that return error messages uh, that are supposed to return errors start timing out. All the successful calls are fine, and they retry when things have failed. But things that return errors go to the max timeout. And so you take a look at the, the logs. And you notice that the server doesn't think things are timing out. The server just sees a whole bunch of requests coming in again and again. And you, you go and you go, hmm, I wonder what I screwed up. And you look at your interceptor code, and you have this sinking feeling where you realize you're retrying after 
every single error, even if it wasn't an error you're supposed to retry. Well, how would you even know when you were supposed to retry an error? And it's this point where you start wondering if you're like in one of those like Kafka-esque holes of, of code where you're like, I've gone too deep. Um, but I've ended up there with this particular problem. So you start trying to figure out how you would know whether an error is worth retrying. Uh, you could use your own gRPC error codes, right, and not use the original ones and maybe use new ones that have special meanings about when you can retry and when you can't. You could decide that certain error codes are worth retrying, like internal errors are worth retrying, but maybe not invalid argument. Um, you could return metadata that had like a new like, metadata flag that says this is an error that's worth retrying or this one isn't. Um, or you could do something even different where instead in your response message, you add a new field to every single one of your response messages that has basically a field that says, if this was an error, is it something you can retry? So what you really want, though, is you want a structured error. You want a way to, instead of just returning a code and a string, you want a way to say, I want to return a full object's worth of parameters, and maybe one of those specifies like whether the error is temporary. Um, and so you come up with a plan. You're not going to be defeated. You've come this far to get automatic retries, so you hatch a plan. You hatch a plan, you create a message structure, an error structure that has a code and a message and a temporary field to let you know whether the error is temporary or not, and another field that someone else in your organization asked for to let you know whether the error is something that a user should see or not. This is a thing that I ran into when doing gRPC development was you could have like a call nested like three layers deep and that call is supposed to return to the user. It's an error message that the user did something wrong, they passed an invalid argument, you want them to see that. Um, but there are other ones from three layers deep that you don't want them to see that are more or less uh, errors that from the standpoint of one service are normal, but from the standpoint of, of the actual end user uh, are not expected and shouldn't be shown. Um, so that was the motivation for that sort of thing. So you create your error object and it gets generated into the protobuf files or into the generated code. And you're like, okay, well, I can create a, a wrapper function just like the status error f that will return that error, but how do I get it back to the client? And that's when things start to get crazy. You create functions that marshal your error into a protobuf format and ones that take it out, and you decide that when the server returns, it will marshal that error into protobuf format and stick it into a header on the response. And then the client side, when it pulls that value out, when a RPC calls returns, it'll look at that header and see that there's a error object in it serialized in protobuf format and deserialize it, and then substitute it as the error that you wanted to return in your interceptor. Anyways, this gets, this gets pretty crazy, but that was the basic motivation of how could you possibly get structured errors back from a service when gRPC really doesn't support it. Um, and that's one of the more frustrating um, problems that I've had with gRPC um, and, and adopting it. Whereas like in HTTP, this problem is easily solved because you get a code and a message and then an entire response body where you can serialize whatever you want. Um, so you do that, and you actually get to the point where you are able to translate these errors across um, the, the service boundary, and you can get rich errors back. And that solves your problem of knowing when an error is temporary to retry or not. At this point, um, you're doing pretty good, but you get another feature request for a dump operation. Basically, give me the entire state of the cache. So you're like, yeah, that's pretty easy. I'll just define this new method. Uh, I'll create a dump request object. Doesn't take anything because we're just going to dump the whole map. And then we will create a repeated set. This is a weird thing about uh, the gRPC protobuf definition format is that there's no array type. You just say repeated. Anyways, uh, that's what it looks like. And you have essentially an array of all of the items in your map, the key, the key and value for each one. 
And the implementation of that, like, pretty straightforward. We've already done that before, so we're not even going to look at it. But you deploy it, and suddenly you don't have enough memory. Your servers are overloaded. People apparently love dumping the entire state of the cache. It's really weird. Um, but there's not enough memory, and you're like, well, hmm, I guess it's probably time that I add some defensive measures to my service. So you take a look at the documentation for the things that you can do to actually control what, how quickly and how many requests uh, callers can send to you. And you find a number of options that you can set. Um, so one thing you can do is you can set the max number of concurrent streams. This is essentially for any particular TCP like uh, transport, um, the number of simultaneous HTTP2 streams that are allowed to run on top of it. So this is how many RPC calls each client is allowed to make simultaneously. Um, but of course, a client could open multiple TCP connections. You need some way to limit how many TCP connections you can open. So you go into your, the place where you're going to bind the listener for the server, and you create a limit listener from the standard library that basically says, well, we can never have more than so many concurrent TCP connections. And now you have a total bound on the number of concurrent things that can be happening in your service. But it still doesn't fix how quickly those things are happening. So gRPC has another option that you can set in here called an in-tap handle, um, which is, I don't know, I guess they're running out of names for things. But basically, the idea uh, is it's a piece of code just like the server interceptor, but it happens a little bit earlier. It happens before method resolution. Uh, so basically, what happens is you uh, define this tap, and you define a handler on it. And you're allowed to do whatever you want in the handler before um, a call is serviced. So you set up a rate limiter um, and basically mark um, each time when a request has come in. And at that point, the rate limiter can tell you whether the global rate limit for this service is allowed to handle has been exceeded. And if it has, then you can return an error and say, sorry, this service is basically just over capacity. Uh, you need to wait a while. And it works. And your service calms back down, and you're back in memory. Like It all fits on a box again. And then there's not enough memory again. It just keeps happening. Your, your cache is just really popular. Um, and people love dumping the full state of the, the system. And it keeps handling. You keep, your cache keeps growing. It's getting really big. Um, so when these dump requests are happening, right, you're taking, you're essentially duplicating the full state in memory of your cache so that you can serialize it back out to the client. You say, hmm this might be a time to start streaming things. So the idea here is that instead of batching up all of the objects in our cache immediately to serialize out to a client in a single message, instead what we'll do is when a client calls us, we'll instead decide that we're going to start streaming those values. So let's say, please dump the state of the cache to me. And we'll say, here's the first value, and here's the second value, and here's the third value, and stream those over the connection. In your uh, gRPC protobuf uh, definition file, um, it looks like this. You basically, instead of having a normal um, response object, you put stream in front of it. And what that signals to the code generator is that you want to stream objects of that type out of that method. So let's take a closer look at what the code looks like for doing streaming. Um, Basically, uh, the parameters that come in are now different. So you get the request object, but instead of getting a context object, you get a stream object. And this is one of the things that I really bugs me about the generated code is like, why isn't there a context object? Like, and now that there is one, the context object is actually hung off the stream object. So they like reversed the parameters. Man, it's really weird. Um, but basically, stream has a method on it, which is send. And the thing that you can pass in to send is the item that you said you were going to stream out of that method. So we loop over our map. And for each item in the map, we, uh, we send that message on the stream to the client. This way, we don't actually have to buffer the entire state of the cache in memory for each call to dump. We can instead just duplicate one value while we're streaming it out to the client. Um, and in the client, the code to read this out, um, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, 
So you see the cache.dump call, instead of getting a response object back, you get a stream object. And the interesting part about the stream object, obviously, is that you can receive messages on it. So you set up a for loop, and you call receive uh, for as long as that receive method doesn't return EOF. And that will stream all of the messages out, and we'll print them all out to the console. Um, one thing to note about this sort of um, mechanism is that timeouts are a giant pain. Um, Basically, when you pass a timeout into uh, a streaming request, it's finite. So if you say like there's a five second timeout, your stream will essentially die after five seconds. So if you actually want to do timeouts like the timeout until I get the first value or the timeout in between two messages, all of that stuff you have to do on your own. There's really no help for it, which is uh, really annoying because it's usually a thing that you want to do. It can signal like whether a server is hung or not, um, and there's not really any native support for it that I've seen. And it works. And then your server's out of memory again. You just can't shake. This is driving you crazy. Um, but you're like, well, I've, I've done all that I can. I can't think of anything more to do. Like I've maxed out the memory on this server. It's probably time to go to multiple servers, right? Where I have multiple cache servers and I load balance between them. And uh, we don't have time to go over load balancing, but load balancing, I'll tell you a little bit about it, is really interesting in gRPC because the fact that you're establishing a single persistent connection means that every request that you make essentially goes to the same endpoint. So if you want to do load balancing, you either need to do one of two things. So uh, by the way, this is the same problem you have in HTTP load balancing if your clients are using persistent connections, right? Persistent connection essentially stickies that client to one server and all of their requests are going to it. So same problem with gRPC, um, where basically what you have to do is you have to put the smarts into the client to know that it's going to open connections to multiple different places, and it's going to pick a different location um, to send a request out over, right? So it establishes multiple connections, and then we'll choose one of those backends to send it to. Of course, you can extract that logic like into a server. Um, and have the client you know, call the server, and the server will do that dispatching for you. Um, there really isn't any, like, there really haven't been any servers. I think there's some new support in a couple things like Envoy, and there's um, some code in the gRPC Go um, library itself for running a load balancer. Um, but it's still pretty new. It's, uh, the spec is still kind of uh, being iterated on. Uh, it's all marked experimental. So if, you're, if you are doing this thing where you need to get to multiple servers and balance between them, um, still in, in the pretty early days. Um, so it's a thing to be aware of. And of course, the craziest part about all this is you can transparently call it from other languages. Here's a Python client. That code generated by the Proto-C compiler is just uh, you know, a Python package, and you import it, and it should look relatively similar to the stuff that we were doing before. One of my big complaints about gRPC is that um, for as great as the cross-language support is, and it's really great um, when you compare it to other things that have tried in this space, like Thrift, um, that just never quite got there, uh, it still like has things where like in Go, it was called a cache client, but in Python, it's called a cache stub. And there's no reason for that difference. It's just different people implemented them, and it's hard to tell the difference. Um, and so we did it. We built a production cache client and server. Uh, so what's, oh no, we're not done. We're, we're not done. Because there's always bad news. There are always things that don't work. And so I wanted to give you a little bit of an idea about what those things are in G gRPC, aside from the error handling, the structured errors, and load balancing. Uh, one of the major things is when you do this sort of thing, you start getting into this mode where you're like, I could use it for everything. I could use it for everything. I could put it in the browser, and then I don't have to write HTTP stubs. I can generate all my JavaScript. And you can't do that. Uh, not yet, at least. Um, there is actually one experimental project that has actually built auto code generation um, into the browser uh, so that you can actually make gRPC calls, but it's not official. Um, and I haven't tried it yet, but it is an interesting thing that's worth checking out. Um, the project's still under development, still things that are happening. Even though it is marked 1.0, you still do get occasional breaking changes in the implementations. There was one in Go recently um, around 
mm, I think it was metadata propagation, something like that. Uh, documentation is still really lacking. You end up in situations where you're like looking at the Python code and you're like, how, especially around the generated code, the actual like things like calling, like going into uh, the gRPC docs and libraries and looking at how do I set up TLS or how do I do things that are in the gRPC package itself um, in any language, those are all documented. Um, some better than others, it really depends on your implementation. The Go and Java ones are usually the best, um, and, and the C core, obviously. Um, the generated languages are, are a little bit second class documentation wise. Um, but the generated code is a real pain where you end up uh, in a situation where you're like, how do I set up timeout on a Python client call? And you have no idea. Um, uh, and yeah, I talked briefly about the standardization across languages, like just even the terminology, stub versus client, things like that. Uh, that being said, it's being used in production in a whole bunch of places. Uh, NGROC uses gRPC exclusively for all of its internal service communication. This is millions of RPCs a day. Uh, Square is one of the original like contributors, basically, who was working with Google when uh, the project was first being uh, open sourced or, or about to be open sourced in building this system and is basically replacing all of their internal R RPC uh, with gRPC. Um, CoreOS, uh, if you've used etcd, the new etcd API is entirely gRPC. There are some methods that are exposed via HTTP, but um, the new standard for using the v3 API is all gRPC. And uh, Google obviously has um, gRPC APIs and also has them, not only that, but they have public uh, gRPC APIs in production. So the, ma the major use case that people have been looking for, looking at gRPC for is internal communication, like within your own systems, uh, both you control the client and the server, um, and Google are kind of, Google and, and CoreOS, I guess, with etcd are the first ones who are starting to expose these APIs publicly um, as supported things for uh, their customers to call. Uh, there are a number of other people, Cockroach, uh, obviously, um, who I think is here as well, um, use gRPC for their communication, things like that. And the future. Uh, where's it going? Uh, it's pretty easy to track. There's a mailing list. Um, if you're interested in development in G gRPC, like, go subscribe to that mailing list. There's a repository with all of the proposals. Um, for how gRPC is supposed to change, and they're, that's pretty active because things are changing still at a rapid pace. Um, new languages are being developed uh, for the code generation, Swift and Haskell. Um, it's the major like improvements that are going on right now are basically all around stability, reliability, and performance. Those are the, the main points that are lacking. There's not a whole lot of feature development going on. That's where most of the effort seems to be going. Um, the, the feature development that is happening is mainly seems to be around uh, adding more customization. So adding things like, for example, uh, for a long time, there were no interceptors. That was not a thing that you could do. Um, and so things like that, where you're basically allowing the client to have more control over how gRPC functions uh, seems to be a major source of investment. Um, and uh, Browser.js, even though uh, it hasn't been implemented yet, it is one of the things that the gRPC team has talked about building and has proposals around um, independent of uh, the company who actually, the third party company who actually built um, Browser, Browser gRPC. And uh, that's about it. Thank you very much.